Welcome everybody to another edition of Unscripted Faith. I'm J. Anthony Gilbert alongside Angela Madden. It's going to be a great show today. We are so excited that you have tuned in and we've got a special, special show today. We do. It's packed full today. It Jay, is. it's packed full. You know, we're going to take some time to begin to understand better our rights as believers, parental rights, faith rights, and all the different spaces, especially amid this chaos that we call today. We're going to also sit down with a woman and talk about harmful habits and how we can actually reconnect ourselves, strengthen mm -hmm. our relationship with the Lord, and begin to maybe understand some of those signs that will lead us down that path of addiction. Yes, indeed. And our next guest is the founder and president of the Pacific Justice Institute, which is a nonprofit 501c3 legal defense organization specializing in the defense of religious freedom, parental rights, and other civil liberties. Brad Dacus knows all about the importance of helping us to understand parental rights, especially as the elections draw near. So we're going to head over to the set yes. here and see what our next guest Brad has to say today. We are so glad to have you today, Brad. Welcome to Unscripted Faith. Oh, it's great to be on the program. Thank you, Angel and Anthony. Well, you know what? I am so excited. We are so excited yes. to have you today because uh, the elections are coming up. There's a lot of things hanging in the balance. And let's just jump right into it. What are you seeing are the hottest topics and situations that are popping up that you're having to defend at your organization? Oh, you bet. Uh, we at Pacific Justice Institute, PGI, we have offices now uh, all coast to coast, 36 offices in 26 states. So we have a big ground game. We know what's happening, and we have over 240-plus cases in active litigation across the country. And one of the hot areas we see taking place is dealing with the issue of parental rights over their children and their children's mm -hmm. education and upbringing. Uh, so we have a, a, you know, a lawsuit filed against the Attorney General of New Jersey. Why? Because he decided to command, order every public school teacher to use pronouns that may violate their conscience, uh, their convictions, and also to lie to parents if any child has any kind of gender confusion. These cases are popping up across America, and parents are angry as they should be, especially when we see it's not just at the local level we're seeing this with some you know, radical school boards. We also see it stretching from, from governor offices, attorney generals, and then all the way to the President of the United States and his policies pushing these on uh, school districts across the nation. So this is a very big issue that we're, we're taking on uh, that is uh, dealing with uh, parental rights. And of course, it also applies to social workers uh, taking children now from families who are Christian families, but they're taking them because the parents are saying, no, we're not going to encourage our child to be gender confused. No, we're going to get our child Christian counseling. For that reason, they're losing their children and it's all over the country and it's increasing. Wow. And that's one reason why we have an article called 12 Steps to Protect Your Children from CPS. Every family in America should have it. It's free, it's on our website, 12 Steps to Protect Your Children, uh, pji.org. I highly, highly recommend every family to get that, to, get that, to know what to do uh, because uh, it's, it's very real and it's, there's very little uh, window of time to, to know what to do when it, when it happens. That's almost mind-blowing that we could be here and find ourselves in this state right yeah. now. How are those situations where children are being taken from their family, how are they coming about? Is it a, a, a teacher's saying that? How does that exactly happen? Well, that's a, it's a great question. Uh, let me give you an example. In Placer County, California, this is just one of many, many cases we're, we're facing right now. A uh, young girl, she was 13, 14 years old, told her, her friend that, you know, I think I feel like I'm a boy. The, the friend told the teacher, teacher told the school counselor. School counselor called the social workers under the state of California, Governor Gavin Newsom. And then that social worker came in, saw the parents, said, hey, uh, how are you going to deal with this? Family says, we're Christians. We love the Lord, and we're going to get our good Christian counseling. And then the uh, social worker says, oh, no, you're not. Uh, here's a warrant. I'm taking this child. They take the child. Wow. And then they, the psychiatrist working for the agency examines the child and says, oh, we need to get immediate guardianship and start the injections immediately, the hormonal injections followed by the surgical procedure, which is ghastly. It's, it's, it's masochism. So that's what happened. 
But we at Pacific Justice, we were contacted by the family before the first injection. We went into court. We got it halted and prevented. Took us two years of fighting and debate and, and arguing this in court, litigating. And then we finally got the girl back with the family. At the last hearing, the girl says, you know, Your Honor, I want you to know, I really don't feel like I'm a boy after all, oh, which wow. is very common. Wow. So okay. this is a classic example, and it's everywhere. It's not just in the, you know crazy California and New York and uh, it's it's all over the country where social workers have drunk the Kool-Aid and they are committed to this this agenda and it makes no sense in terms of science, medicine, statistics, no. and children who encourage down this road, who are solidified in this confusion, their suicide rate now is 12 times higher yep. than average children, adolescents their age. Uh, we cannot stand by and let this to continue to happen, but these are the policies being pushed aggressively by this administration. And people need to understand, it's going to get a lot worse if they're affirmed and the, in, in, in if the Congress goes in this direction. Parents need to vote. The love of Christ compels us to do nothing less but to vote and vote responsibly and biblically uh, this upcoming election. Our children deserve nothing less. Well, Brad, let me first say on behalf of ourselves, uh, yes. thank you for yes. what you're doing. I mean, the work you guys are doing is just so, so vitally important at Specific Justice Institute. Um, but the question that I do have for you is what are the parents' rights? Mm -hmm. What do we as parents, because my kids go to a private school, but there's a lot of people that are probably watching right now, their kids are in public school. Our, we go to a Christian school, our kids are taught the right gender and all those types of things. But if they're out there and they're in a public school, what do you tell parents their rights are and what can they enforce? Yeah. Well, first I encourage them to consider alternative education. Um, yeah, amen to that. You know, my, my wife and I, we wrote a book called Reclaim Your School, How to Legally Evangelize Public Schools. And there's great ministries out there like decisionpoint.org, just doing great things in public schools. But the reality is public schools, even with Christian teachers out there, they have effectively become spiritual death camps. So one of the first things parents need to do is look at alternative education. We're helping churches start homeschool co-ops, for example, wow. to help parents who can't homeschool on their own for different reasons. Um, and to, to work together. But parents who still have their kids in public schools, uh, that's a reality. Uh, they need to, first off, they need to use opt-out forms uh, to help protect their children from the questions and interrogations and things like that. We have them customized for every state in the country on our website. People can download those once again for free. All our legal representation is without charge. We're a legal ministry. And uh, they can download that from our website. P just go to pji.org. That's number one. Hey, Brad. Download the form and sign it and send it in. And then also communicate with your teachers to look at the curriculum and find out exactly what is, is being taught and what people are coming in to do guest speaking. Hey, Brad, real quickly, I wanted to ask you a question about the opt-out <coughs> forms. Is, is that, are you allowed to do that everywhere at any school? They can get those forms for you and they can take that and they have a, a right to opt out no matter what school district they're in. And I, exactly. Wow. Every state has different nuances, but we've customized those into the opt-out forms. Wow. Wow, that is a powerful resource yeah, because there is. is so much continually being shoved down their throat. I have a question. Where did this 13 years of age thing come in? Because I see it even with my health insurance for my daughters. I was told when they turn 13, they are discussing their issues. They have to give me permission. Wow. Kind of give me permission. Wow. They're not paying right. the bills. Where did this come from? <laughs> Yeah, um, these are legislators um, and state legislatures pass this, this, these kinds of laws <coughs> to supposedly protect their privacy. Uh, but parents are still parents. And I encourage <coughs> parents and young, to let their young people know, say, hey, when the doc if the doctor says this, um, you can say you still have the right to say, no, I want my mom in the room with me. I want my dad in the room with me. Yeah. Um, and they, the doctors have to uh, give in to that. They have to respect the, that request from the children. The doctors won't say that, though. They say, oh, no, parents aren't allowed in. No, the parents can come in under law if the child says, no, I'm not coming in unless my mother comes in, too, or we're done. And the doctors will then say, go ahead, the parent, come on in. So that's just a little, a little side note there. But um, these are state legislators, and we at Pacific Justice Institute, we have a whole division working with friendly state, le state legislatures in a number of states across the country. But... Other states, you know, there's states out there that are 
have a lot of battles. Uh, Pennsylvania is one of them. Oh, yeah. Um, and there's, you know, there's a lot of battles taking place. Uh, people need to elect state legislators that understand parents' rights and are not beholden to some establishment out there. Uh, that's uh, something the voters of Pennsylvania need to take to heart this election. You know, Brad, if there's people out there and they need help and they're fighting some type of battles, uh, how do they get in contact with you? Do you have services that are offered to everybody, and how do they go about that? Yeah, we have an office in Pennsylvania, I might add, uh, wow. going to bat for, for people without charge. So uh, in, in, in Ohio and in other states, so they should uh, just simply go to our website, pji.org. Uh, we're a nonprofit ministry. If they'd like to support us financially, that's great, but not required. And they can also get our legal insight, our newsletter, to keep up with our many cases and their rights across the country. Uh, we want to empower individuals. We want to defend individuals. And we want to allow legislators and help them push uh, their state in the right direction. And, uh, of course, we're also enabling churches to have their voice heard by having voter registration Sunday. So there's still a little time left for, for, for uh, different states to do that as well. So we're here to help, pji.org. And you also, Brad, have uh, things on your website. People can go and register for voting as well. Is that what I heard you just say? That's right. Wow. Uh, they can do that and, uh, in all 50 states. We need people to register. Um, the love of Christ compels us not to be silent. Uh, it's simply that important. Ezekiel 3.18 makes it really clear that um, if we're silent, God will hold us accountable for our silence. Um, so this is not an option. People need to vote. They need to vote biblically, and they need to do so with the love of Christ for those who are being victimized by evil and wicked policies across the nation. Wow. Brad, thank you so much for your time. We are honored to have you, and we'll be praying God's blessing upon you. Keep doing what you're doing. We so appreciate your work. Yes. Thank you. God bless you and what you're doing, too. Thank you. Thank God for Brad. When we come back, we'll be joined by certified sobriety coach, Christy Osborne, and she's going to share why the best life is a sober life. We'll be right back. When you give to Cornerstone Television this month, we'll send you Encouraging Words for a Discouraging World by Dr. Jeremiah. Filled with encouraging and inspiring words, Dr. Jeremiah helps you navigate the difficulties of daily life with faith, courage, and resilience. He shares practical insights and timeless wisdom from the Bible that will help you find hope, comfort, and strength even in the darkest of times. This book includes biblical examples of hope that will inspire you during challenging seasons, inspiring teachings on how to claim victory even in the hardest of times, practical wisdom for holding God's promises in your heart. Whatever hardship you're facing, encouraging words for a discouraging world will help you find perspective, hope, and a renewed sense of purpose. Request your copy today as our thank you gift when you give to CTVN. To give, call 888-665-4483 or go to ctvn.org slash donate. Our next guest found her true calling when she chose sobriety and discovered her passion for helping women with their own journeys. Christy Osborne is now a certified sobriety coach and she joins us now to share how quitting alcohol has made all the difference in her life and in how it can make a difference in your life as well as others. Christy, welcome to Unscripted Faith. Hi guys, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. We are excited to have you and to talk to you a little bit. Now, Chrissy, your story is a little bit different. You weren't actually addicted to alcohol, but you turned your life around. You saw it was getting too close and chose another path. Can you speak to us in a short moment and share with us how that all came about? Yeah, sure. Well, addicted, addiction is a spectrum, right? And so looking back, there was definitely an addiction there, but it wasn't an addiction to the point where I had this massive rock bottom moment. I never pictured myself, for example, walking to an AA meeting because I wouldn't have said my drinking was quote bad enough. And so I basically, what happened was on the two year anniversary of my mom's passing, I realized I had been drinking a lot to cope with her loss and this tremendous grief that I had. And I was lying in bed looking at my Instagram and I just saw this complete disconnect from who I was, the mother I wanted to be, the wife that I wanted to be. I didn't feel like I was showing up in the way that I that I wanted to. And I, I just shouted this prayer to Jesus of, I just help me, Lord, I can't keep going like this. I was really sad and depressed and alcohol was just pouring gasoline on the fire. 
And so I started this experiment just to see what my life would be like without alcohol in it. I never put a number on it. I didn't think it would be forever. There is no way I ever thought I'd be sitting here talking to you guys about this or that this would be my job now or this book that I've gotten to write. I just, I wanted to see if I felt better with, without alcohol in it. And so that's kind of how, what kicked, kicked the whole thing off. Yeah. So most of the time with people, there's something that triggers their addiction. There's something that causes it to escalate. You know, we were just talking mm -hmm. with Brad, we're taking a look at young people uh, and what's going on in their world. They're being faced with gender confusion. They're being faced even with addiction and vaping and all those things. What are you seeing are some of the biggest problematic areas that people, why they're turning to addiction? Yeah, so I work primarily with women. And so there is, we all drink for a certain reason. And especially with women and as mothers, we drink for rest. We drink to ease anxiety. We drink for connection. We drink for reward. We drink because we believe that alcohol has all these benefits. And then in reality, when we look at science and when we look at the truth of God's word and everything that we know now, because we know so much more about alcohol now, yeah. it actually doesn't do any of the things that we're drinking it for, right? So right. if you are drinking to de-stress, to lower anxiety, we now know that alcohol spikes our yeah. adrenaline and cortisol, yeah. right? And it stays in our system for seven to 10 days after that. And so it's, it does the exact opposite of what we're drinking it for. Well, how did you learn how to love life sober then? Because, you know, obviously you said you were turning to it to be able to cope with some things, some losses and things along that line. What was the replacement of alcohol? So I got rid of alcohol. You know, they talk about being a dry drunk. You know, you can just not mm -hmm. be drinking, but you're still not whole. Yeah. What caused you to become whole? Yeah, so this was really about not buckling down and just using willpower not to yeah. drink. This is what a lot of people do, including myself, in like a dry January challenge, right? Just to kind of prove to ourselves that maybe we don't have a quote unquote problem. But for me, it was about getting under the hood to figure out why I right. was drinking in the first place and overturning those and realizing that actually I had, you know, if I was drinking to have fun or for joy, I actually had more joy when my dopamine and everything reset when I wasn't drinking. So it was very much this experimental mindset going in and trying all the things that I had been doing drinking as a non-drinker and seeing if it was better. And over time it was. And then we get to root ourselves right in like the truth of God's word and open up space for him. And that's when everything for me changed. Wow. I think that even just the fact that you experimented and through that experimentation found, wow, I'm actually more empty when I'm drinking. It's just like the yeah. enemy, you know, he always promises a better life when in fact our bodies are actually evidence that it's counter to what is good life. So today, living and loving life sober, what are some of the key things that you have implemented into your life to make sure you're loving it to its fullest? Yeah, one of the most important things is community, right? It's being with other women, obviously, in the word, and that looks different in multiple ways for me, right? Bible studies and that stuff within my um, alcohol-free community is super important. Putting in time and space to be in the word, which I could never do with a hangover, right? Because <laughs> in the morning, that's really hard. Um and so, and just, you know, being, being present with the kids as opposed to like having that feel like a chore, which it did when I was drinking because everything's again, harder when you have a hangover. And so it's about doing the things that actually really, really light you up, making space, being intentional about what your, your day-to-day -day looks like. Um, and for moms as well, I talk to so many of my clients that that means being really intentional about creating space for yourself um, and rest. Um, so many things. Christy, I have a double question for you because you are a yeah. double certified sobriety <laughs> coach. So one, yes. yeah. how do you become a coach? And number two, how would somebody find somebody like you to be able to apply that in their life? Yeah, so I got two life uh, coaching certifications, one as a Christian um, Christian life coach, and one then that dealt with addiction and sobriety. So that's where the double certification comes in. And um, I mean, you can find me on my website. There's more and more of us popping up, which is amazing yeah, because you definitely have to be able to relate to your coach because we like to get really vulnerable and open with each other. And 
And I felt so alone when I started this myself. I didn't know anybody that was like drinking like me and questioning it. And so um, it's just a matter of finding someone that you relate to um, and that you can be open and tell your story to. But it's so, so powerful because you soon realize that you're not alone and that we all drink for very similar reasons. And and that once you once you really get under the hood and start exploring how you feel without alcohol, how much better that you can feel. You know, I love that you talk to this mom wine culture, you know, and it is, it's very high, it's um, accepted. It's highly accepted, mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, just to relax and to unwind. But you talk about how in the morning you would be so covered with shame from it. Could mm -hmm. you share a little bit of what that shame looked like? Because I'm sure there are moms who are participating in that, you know, just having a glass of wine with my girlfriends, this is how we relax. But can you speak to that um, and, and how it kind of surfaced in your life and how they can maybe come through it too? Yeah, well, alcohol is a highly addictive substance, right? And when you've been drinking it for long enough, you end up getting hooked on it, obviously. And so there is this want and this desire to moderate, for example, like just have the two glasses at the end of the day. But the longer you're drinking and the more you're doing that, that becomes yeah. harder and harder. And so the shame piece kicks in usually around 3 a.m. when you wake up and you start just asking yourself, why can't I stick to those two glasses? But the thing is, is that like, we weren't meant to go head to head with a highly addictive substance and outsmart it, right? Like that's really, really hard. And so the shame piece comes in as well because then you look all around you and you're like, oh wait, all the moms seem to be drinking like me. They have a couple glasses of wine when the homework book comes out just to de-stress after a long day at work when the kids come home. And so it's hard to feel like you um, want to be different and do something different and overcome these addictive nature of alcohol when it looks like everybody's keeping it cute, so to speak. So the shame piece really comes in and then we end up drinking even more because we want to exit that shame. And it, it, yeah, it just keeps us stuck in this particular part of our brain that then alcohol can quiet that noise. And so it perpetuates this shame message. Without a doubt, and I'm sure that you've uh, talked to a lot of different people that battle with that as well, and then because they feel shame, then they want to drink more, and then there's yeah. more yeah. shame, and yeah. it's a never-ending cycle. We got about a minute left. Uh, can you give us a testimony of somebody that you've coached through and how they're doing now? Yeah, oh my gosh. Um, actually, a gal that I just have a voice note from right before hopping on with you, um, just a few sessions together, but she realized that alcohol was completely holding her back, what she wasn't able to be present with her kids. And now she's broken free. And wow. now we're talking about like what next for her, which is so exciting and how she's going to use all this new mental real estate and um, time that she has that she's not feeling fuzzy and what she's going to do with that for her kids and for the Lord. So it's really exciting. It's the best job ever. That's awesome. Oh, awesome. Christy, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for this phenomenal resource and blessings to you. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Coming up next, Jay and I discuss our thoughts on setting goals and how to make sure they align with the will of God. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this short break. This week on Sister to Sister, someone wrote this question. My 16-year-old daughter is sexually active. What do I do? 16, nothing. <laughs> what about the emotional affair of a mature woman? Yeah, lots of good stuff this week. Make Cornerstone Network your home for the best in local Christian TV, bringing you programs like... You hear news that their loved ones are home, and they should know that we will not rest. We will not rest until we fulfill our mission to bring all our hostages back home. We left the light on for you. Cornerstone Network is your home for Christian television. Welcome home. Well, welcome back to Unscripted Faith. I always like this part because this is a chance we get to encapsulate everything that's been kind of happening today. And you know, we we're talking with Brad and we we're talking with Christy and we see how they're so passionate about what God has called them to do and what they're doing to make an impact in people's yeah. lives. I mean, Christy helping people dealing with addiction. Brad, I mean, outstanding work that he's doing, defending parental rights and things on that line. Yeah. And we see how God's will 
and just yes. fulfillment and all that all intersect. How does that materialize for you? You know, Jay, I think one of the biggest takeaways from both of those conversations is that in the space where I give God space, I find his will. Amen. And I'm able to more clearly guide my life towards his goals, his dreams for my life. You know, I think about even what P PJI is doing and how yeah, they're helping parents yeah. to to form children's minds and, and direct them in the path of God's narrow way. And um, yeah, so for me, I think I just, I go first, I'm centered in Christ. As I'm centered there, he ignites my heart and gives me desires that then I pursue. Amen. How about you? Well, you know, I think the main thing for me is just really finding out what God's will was for my life yeah. and finding that out by almost doing things I didn't do or yeah. that, that I wasn't called to do and then finding that out. And so uh, it's just Good. for me, it's what we're doing right now. Yes. Uh, it's pastoring. It's being a dad and all things. And I find so much joy and passion in those things. And so yeah. that's what's really done it for me. I love that you said that too, though, because there is this kind of exploration, as Chrissy said, this experimentation that yeah. we're all doing in yeah. life, you know, trying to figure it out. And as you go down those paths, it's not going to be perfect. But when you hit something and you're like, ah, that doesn't feel right. That's disjointed. I don't find the peace of God. I don't feel goodness here. I'm not passionate. I'm not good. Then you can, oh, I can realign. This, this feels more like the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Yeah. Jay, what would you say was one of those key moments that redirected your life towards his purpose? Wow. Um, I would probably say, I shared this before, but when I was on my way to radiology school, I got accepted to a big school and I was so disappointed because long story short, some things fell through. I got accepted, but then the door shut. Um, and right after that, I got called to go into ministry. And when I got went to World Harvest Bible College, now called Valor Christian College, everything just began to open up for me. And I began to, to sense so much joy and happiness in my life and fulfillment. Wow. I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Yeah. But it, that's when it really transitioned for me because I was on my way. I wanted to go into the medical field. I wanted yes. to be a doctor, radiology, all of those things. Like I said before, I didn't want to be a pastor because all the pastors, their wives wasn't cute. They was broke and they all looked unhappy. So I wasn't happy <laughs> with that. But I realized, you know, listen, if you are in God's will for your life, that's, that's all that matters. Everything that's else it. will be added unto you. That's it. I love that, Jay. And it's Amen. so true. Like, I really think that that radiology disappointment was really his greatest guidance, yeah, his exactly. guide rail to get you to where you were called to be. You know, similar stories. I thought that I was going in the medical field when I went to Boston College. I went in as a pre-med major and I was going to do medical missions. But honey, thank God he continued to speak and I continued to listen because mm -hmm. once I've got on the mission field, I wasn't created for it. You know That's what I mean? Right. Like, I, I can't eat the food. Yeah. I, I don't do the things. <laughs> do but God that. directs us clearly and beautifully. And we trust that God is directing you into paths of his righteousness and his goodness. He will continue to lead you. Listen, lean into him and stay centered. You will find you are in the center of his will when you're centered in him. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.